This is lesson 6.1 for 8th grade accelerated math and it's about scatter plots and correlation. You should have already done your task about the guess my age activity and so if you haven't done that then you need to stop this video and go back and do that task. Okay learning about scatter plots just to review there's a couple of skills that we're going to be using a lot and so if you review we learned about point slope formula and that's where we write the equation of a line if we have a point and two or a point and a slope. And remember that we learned back when we did that, that, so, okay, so for example, if I give you a slope and I give you an ordered pair, then you have a point and a slope. But if I look at number one right here, I don't have a slope, I have two points. And so the first thing that we need to do is we need to find a slope. So remember to find a slope, you do y minus y over x minus x. And so if we do that, and make sure you got your y's on the top, but that's gonna be four over negative one plus one is zero, so that's undefined. And so if I'm gonna write the equation of that line, because I have to write the equation, the equation's not undefined. The equation for that, if you think about an undefined slope, it's gonna be a vertical line, and that goes through the x-axis. So x is going to equal, look at your points, x is gonna equal negative one, so that's my equation. Okay, let's look at number two. I've got two points, so again, first thing is I'm gonna find the slope. So I'm gonna do y minus y over x minus x and remember that it's important that you do the x's and the y's in the same order so if i do the 14 minus 6.8 i have to do 3.2 minus 6.8 or sorry minus 5.6 if i do um, 6.8 minus 14 then i have to do 5.6 minus 3.2 okay so once i do the math the 14 minus 6.8 and the 3.2 minus 5.6 i get 7.2 divided by negative 2.4 and it does come out to be an integer negative 3. Now in this lesson and in this unit, we are going to see a place where actually with our scatter plots, we're going to have some slopes that are decimals. And this is one place where that's okay. However, we wouldn't wanna leave it like that because that's not simplified. So you need to check and see, does it simplify? Now for this unit, if you get a slope like um, six divided by seven, then this, in this unit, when we do scatter plots, it's actually appropriate to write that as a decimal, but we'll talk about that as we go. Okay, the next thing, since I know that my slope is equal to three, now I'm gonna choose one of my points. It doesn't matter which point, just choose one of them. And remember, I've got x sub one and y sub one, so I'm gonna say y minus y sub one equals m times x minus x sub one. So we're just following point slope formula from what we did before. So I'm gonna simplify that, y minus 14 is equal to negative three x, and then negative three times negative 3.2 is going to be positive 9.6. Then I'm gonna add 14 to both sides to get it simplified into slope intercept form. And for that, I'm going to get um, 23.6. And so I do have a decimal there. So like I said, in this unit, we're gonna see some things a little bit different than what we've seen before. I've always said that your slope is a ratio, it's rise over run, however, there are a couple of situations, and this is one, where it's appropriate to have a decimal for a slope, so we'll see some examples like that. So, just review point slope formula. Okay, so we're gonna talk what is a scatter plot. So when you did the guess my age activity, you created a scatter plot based on the ages that you guessed compared with the ages that were actually true. And so what a scatter plot is, it shows us a relationship between a set of data with two variables. So the two variables in the guess my age activity were the guessed age that was on your x-axis and the actual age and that was on your y-axis. So those were my two variables. And the relationship that you saw was, you know, were you a strong guesser or a weak guesser? Like, did you guess well, did you guess high? And so you kind of saw the relationship between your guesses and the actual age. We graph those, re those two numbers, those two sets of data, as ordered pairs on a coordinate plane. So the scatter plot on the right, this one about hours of study, that's our one variable, versus test scores, shows the relationship between how many hours a student studies and their test score. So if we look at the picture, we see if, it, if a student studies five hours, then they their test score is probably somewhere around there, about you know 55, something like that. And we also notice that as they study more, so if we go to 20, then their test scores are a little bit higher. And so, you know, we see these different data. And so it looks like to get this scatter plot, you know, you could count the points one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on, and find out like approximately how many students they asked. Now I say approximately because maybe two students both said the same thing. 
And you might have seen that on the Guess My Age activity where maybe you had the same guess and same actual age for a couple of people. Because I know there's a couple of people in there that are the same age. So maybe you guessed the same. Um, if a trend of pattern, is, a trend is a pattern of behavior and we can observe that over time in multiple studies. So the more data we have, we can notice more of a trend. And so what we did with the Guess My Age activity and what we're gonna be doing is you're gonna get your straight edge and you're gonna put it down here and draw a line of best fit. Now a line of best fit is basically showing a pattern of behavior. So it's called a trend line, okay? Or a line of best fit, the line that best fits the data. It's a line that describes this trend on the scatter plot. So get your straight edge and you're gonna draw a line. Now, is this a line of best fit? No, of course not. That doesn't fit my data at all. What about that? That doesn't fit my data at all. And so you put your ruler down and you put a line that's going to fit the data. So maybe something like that. Now yours might be slightly different. Maybe you're going to think that it's like that and that wouldn't be wrong. And maybe somebody else is gonna draw a slightly different line. Okay, but we all have pretty much the same idea. So one of the tricky things about lines of best fit is that it is kind of a little bit of a variance because people can do a slightly different line that fits the data. And so you wanna get the best one you can, and it does not have to actually touch any of the points. One thing you're not doing is you're not doing like connect the dot, okay? That's not a line of best fit. So you're gonna draw your line of best fit, do the best one you can, and then we're gonna work from there. Okay, a scatter plot on the right shows the line of best fit drawn to represent, oh, this is for the next one, sorry. So let's go to the next um, picture. So this line of best fit, Let's see, it shows the line drawn to represent the trend data. So this right here, this red line, that's the line that I drew to fit the scatter plot. So if you look on my scatter plot right here, and, and yours on your paper, of course, isn't colored, but this one is colored. If you look at the purple dots, that's my data. That's like when I went and got information. So we found out how much time bicyclists, bicyclists had been going and how much distance they had left to go. So when they hadn't gone, been biking for very long, they still had a long ways to go. So they'd been biking for like 15 minutes and they still had about 150 miles left to go. When they'd been biking for an hour, they only had, well, no, nobody was asked at an hour. So at about an hour and a half, they had, you know, this guy's slower than this one because that one probably had moved forward a little bit. But this is like how much they have left to go. So the longer they've been biking, so when it's been like, you know, five hours and 15 minutes, they only had like 20 miles left to go. And so that's the data that we're comparing. Now you'll also notice that I have two dots that are black. Well, hold on, I'll talk about that in a second. I've got my trend line and so I got a ruler and I did this line that I thought best fit the data. Now, if you were doing this, you might have done like maybe a little bit higher or maybe a slightly different slope and that's okay. We're all just trying to get the best trend line we can. And you'll notice that these two black dots, these were not points that I actually asked. I didn't actually ask a bicyclist that had been biking for six hours. I didn't actually ask somebody at exactly two hours and they said 120 miles. These are two points that I choose that are on my line. Now maybe I could pick two points from people that I actually asked. So maybe if I actually asked somebody that was right there, or maybe if I actually ask somebody that was right there, that would be fine. Sometimes when you draw your line of best fit, you're going to get some of those points from your data, but sometimes your line of best fit doesn't actually include any data points. So when we use our line of best fit, you're going to choose two points on your line and you wanna pick two points that you can tell exactly where they are. You don't wanna pick something like this. You can't tell exactly where that is. And so you don't wanna pick something that you don't know exactly what that is. It's gotta be on the line and you need to be able to tell exactly what that is. So if we look at these ordered pairs, like that one right there, that one is two, 120. And then this ordered pair is six, 20. And so those are two ordered pairs that I can use. And so we warmed up with the point slope formula. We can use that to find what is the equation of that line. So this line right here has an equation, y equals mx plus b, we're gonna find it. So I'm gonna start with um, finding my slope. So we're gonna use point slope formula <clears throat> to find the line of best fit. When you're finding the equation of line of best fit, it is reasonable and logical to use decimals, okay? So that's something that's new. 
we haven't done that before. We're not going to do that all the time, but in this situation, it's reasonable. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find my slope. So my two ordered pairs, let me write them down. So 2 and 120 and 6 and 20. So the first thing is my slope. So I'm going to do y minus y. So I'm going to do 120 minus 20 over, I have to do 2 minus 6 because of the order. So that's going to be 100 over negative 4, which is negative 25. So my slope is negative 25. I don't need any decimals for that. It comes out nice and pretty. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use point slope formula. So remember, point slope formula is y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. And you're going to insert a number in place of y sub 1, m, and x sub 1. And so obviously, there's my m. To get your x sub 1 and your y sub 1, just pick either this point or this point. It does not matter which one, whichever one you like. I'm going to choose the one with the smaller numbers, so I'm going to choose that one. So I'm going to say y minus, the y is 20 in that ordered pair, negative 25, and then x minus 6. And then I'm going to simplify it. Now if you don't believe that I could use either line or either point, then you go ahead and try and see what you find out. But I can use either one and I will end up with the same thing. So this is my line of best fit. This is the equation that best fits what I see in this line right here. And the reason why I want that equation is because now I could say, all right, well, what if a bicyclist had been biking for 3.7 hours? How far would they have left to go? So you would just do negative 25 times 3.7 hours plus 170, and you would calculate that. So if I put that in my calculator, um, negative 25 times 3.7 plus 170, that means that they would have 77 and a half miles left to go. Now think about what else this tells us. This tells us that when the bicyclists started, when they began their trip, they were 170 miles. That's how far they had to go. And then they started biking. And how far were they going every hour? Does this equation tell us how many miles they traveled in one hour? So in one hour, how many miles were taken off their 170? So think about what part of the equation tells us that. So that's a review question. You should know that. So if you don't know that, I want you to pause the video and stop and think about which of these numbers tells us how fast they're going. Okay, so the next thing I want you to do is go to your, line, your task where you did the guess my age, and I'm going to have you choose two points that are on your line of best fit. So your line is going to be different than mine, and so you're not probably going to have the same two ordered pairs that I'm going to have. So prepare for a little bit of difference, but you go to your line of best fit. So you've got, you've got your scatter plot. Actually, it's probably more like this. Okay, so you have a line, and so you're going to choose two points that you can tell exactly where they are on your line okay and then come back and we're going to put those two ordered pairs right there so pause the video go to your task and find two points okay i looked at my graph and i chose two points now like i said your points are very likely going to be different so we're going to be doing the same work but with different points so you're going to take your points and using your two points you're going to find your equation of the line of best fit it probably won't be the same as my equation of the line of best fit. Hate it when I'm making a video and the intercom comes on. Okay, um, so the first thing we're gonna do is find a slope. So I'm gonna take my points. I can't emphasize enough, I don't want you to get panicked because you have different numbers. You just take your numbers and you find your slope. So I'm gonna do mine, you do yours. So my slope comes out to be 6 over 5. Now for this, I am going to actually change that into a decimal. So my decimal is going to be 1.2. Now yours might be different. It might be the same, but it might be different. However, we're all going to have some similarities. Everybody should have a positive slope. Okay, so if you have a negative slope, then you need to go back and look at what you did because your line of best fit was going up. Okay. Um, and so you should have you know, a positive slope. All of us should have something around one. So like maybe you have 0.9, maybe you have 1.1, maybe you have 1.3, maybe you have 0.8. And so something like that. You shouldn't have something like four. That's way too steep. You did not guess that badly. So anyway, that's gonna be my slope. 
Now the next thing we're going to do is you're going to choose one of your points. Just pick one of them. I'm going to choose my 40, 44. You choose one of yours. It doesn't matter which. We're going to put it into point slope formula. So you go ahead and pause the video and put yours into point slope formula. And then we're going to simplify. So you're going to end up with a line of best fit, y equals mx plus b. So when you're done with your line, come back on and just watch how I did it. Make sure you did it the same way. Add 44 to both sides and when I add 44 to both sides I get that okay now if I look at what this says this is my equation line best fit now yours probably is a little bit different like I said our slope should be like somewhat similar and your y-intercept it may not be negative 4 it might be positive 1 or positive 3 or negative 1 or maybe it's even 0 and so that's going to be okay and that's the thing with the line of best fit is we're going to have slightly different numbers so when you grade your homework you're going to have to be open to it's going to vary a little bit and your job is to figure out did it vary too much did you do something wrong is it too varying should i go back and see if i can do it better and as we learn more about this we'll get more and more precise so think about what this means if i'm thinking about with the guess my age activity, the x-axis was how much I guessed they were, and this was the actual age. So how much I guessed was my x-coordinate, and how much they actually were was y. And so you can use this to say, well, what if I guessed that somebody was 40? How much were they in real life? You can actually find that out because you could say, well, if I guessed that they were 40, then probably because of the way I use, I usually guess numbers, I can say, well, they're probably not 40. They are probably, and I'm gonna do this math, 1.2 times 40 and then take away four, they're probably 44. So I usually guess that people are younger than they are. And so you can see like, how does yours compare? Do you usually guess that people are older than they are or younger than they are? And that's what this line can help us with. Now, if you think about it, if I guessed that somebody was zero, so if I guess that they were zero, that would actually mean that they were negative four years old. Now, obviously that doesn't make any sense because somebody can't be negative four years old. And what that means, if you extended your line to zero, zero, which on your graph that you had, this point right here was 20, 20, it was not zero, 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 zero is down there. Whoops, zero, zero is way down there. So if you extended it to zero, zero, that would just mean that my line's gonna be going below the origin there. And so that's okay. Because lines of best fit, they're not going to be true forever. They're just true for a little while. So anyway, that's how you find the line of best fit. Now let's talk about some other things that have to do with the line of best fit. The next thing is the word correlation. And the correlation basically tells us, is there a relationship between the two sets of data? And so when I say, you know, is there a relationship between the age that you guessed and the age that they actually are? Yeah, there's some kind of relationship because usually if people are older, they look older. If people are younger, they usually look younger. And so, you know, that's usually a, a good clue. So you're not gonna look at me and guess that I'm 20 because I don't think I look 20. Well, I mean, if you do, that's great. But anyway, um, so you've got the two, you've got the relationship. And so let me give you an example of, you know, something that wouldn't have a relationship. So right now I'm sitting at my desk and I'm looking at, okay, I've got this number of paper clips on my desk. And so let's say I have 100 paper clips on my desk. And then let's just say that I'm going to run home real quick and see how many shoes I have in my closet. I can have 100 paper clips. And let's say I go home and I have 50 shoes in my closet. Is there a relationship between those two numbers? No. I can write an ordered pair all I want, but that doesn't mean there's a relationship. Then if I go over to Mr. Kunkel's room and I see how many paper clips he has on his desk, and I go home and see, well, that would be weird. But if I say, tell me how many shoes you have in your closet, and he's like 25 because my kid lost one of them, is there a relationship? No, that's ridiculous. So just because there's data, that doesn't mean there's a relationship. But the correlation, if it's a strong correlation, we can see that there is a relationship. So we'll talk about some other types of things. Now, one thing to be clear about correlation is just if there is a correlation, that doesn't necessarily mean that the one thing caused another one. Okay, so just because, you know, if you eat a lot of calories and so your weight goes up, 
you might think, well, there's a correlation there. You eat a lot and so your weight goes up. And that probably does have something to do with it. However, some people, like they can eat not very much, but their weight does not go down. It not in the same way, like maybe they just stay the same. They are sick and so they're not eating anything, and but they have some metabolism problem and so their weight either stays the same or goes up. And so that could be something. And so the eating isn't necessarily causing it. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. So this is called correlation is not causation. And so that's just a whole other thing. But just, just remember that it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. It's just that there's a relationship between the two ideas. Okay, so we have different types of correlation. There's a positive correlation. That occurs when as the X value increases, the Y value increases. So like I said, if you eat more, you gain more. So if you ask a lot of people like how many calories you eat, how much you weigh, like you would maybe see that there was some correlation there. Um, you could see like the more you study, the higher your grades. Now people get kind of confused because they think that it's always a good thing. Positive correlation could also be something like the less you study, the lower your grades. That's also positive correlation because both of these are going the same way. So if we say study a little, get a bad grade. Study a lot, get a good grade. That's still positive correlation. So all of these three graphs right here show positive correlation. But there's some, you notice that the one on the left, it shows that all the dots are like right there on the line. And then these are a little more spread out. And then these are really on the line too. And so these are all positive correlations, but this one is strong, okay? This one is weak because it's further out. Sorry, I said they're all positive. This one is a negative correlation and that's the next kind. That occurs when as the X increases, the Y decreases. So as you go further and further along, you're getting smaller values. And so an example of that would be the more you brush your teeth, the fewer cavities you have, okay? Um, the more you do things for others, whoops, the more you do things for others, the less they hate you, okay? Maybe something like that, I don't know. So that's negative correlation, and it doesn't have to be something bad, it can be something good, all right? Like, you know, the more you brush your teeth, the fewer cavities you have, that's a good thing. But negative correlation, if you compare the negative and the positive correlation pictures, you notice about the slopes, notice how the positive correlation has a positive slope on those lines. Negative correlation has a negative slope. Compare this strong negative correlation to this weak negative correlation. What do you notice about the strong versus the weak? What do you notice about the weak positive correlation compared to the weak negative correlation? Do you notice how the dots are like more spread out? We've got a picture here of moderate negative correlation, so it's still going down, but notice how the dots are a little bit closer together than they were when it was weak. Okay, so we've got strong, moderate, and weak correlation. Or sorry, strong, moderate, and no correlation. So there's the strong, uh, sorry, yeah, strong, moderate, weak, no correlation. Okay, so we've got the strength of the correlation, how strong the relationship is. And then we've also got positive correlation and negative correlation. Okay, so this is a lot of vocabulary. So negative correlation, you're gonna have a decreasing trend line. So if you look at your task where you did the guess my age, you should have had a positive correlation. Now how strong it was, that's gonna depend on how well you guessed. So if you guessed really, really well, you're gonna have a very strong correlation. Maybe your line was like that. If you didn't guess that well, like sometimes you guessed way off, you're gonna have maybe something that looks more like that. Maybe it was somewhere in the middle. Maybe you had more of a moderate. So maybe your dots were like a lot closer to your line, but still, you know, not right on. So what would you judge? Would you think that it was weak or strong or moderate? And it could be different for everybody. A scatter plot with neither correlation. So if it doesn't look positive and it doesn't look negative, it's said to have no correlation. Okay, and that just means that the dots are scattered everywhere. It's like the paper clips in my shoes. Like there's no correlation. If I went around to every teacher in the school and saw how many paper clips they had and then said, how many shoes do you have in your closet? That has nothing to do with it. So I'd probably have a scatter plot that looks like this. Okay, the closer the data points are to the line of best fit, the trend line, the stronger the correlation is between the two data sets. So we'll talk about strength here coming up. But number five, it says, does the data have a positive correlation, negative correlation, or no correlation? Okay, so if we look at, and so this is referring back to our task, 
Okay, so on your task, does it, would you say that it has um, positive correlation, negative correlation, no correlation? Hopefully you said positive, because if you said negative or no, that probably means you did something wrong on that, because I don't think that you're gonna regularly guess that somebody that's really young is very old. So that's probably not gonna happen. By looking at how closely the data points are to your trend line, would you consider your relationship strong, moderate, or weak? So here again, look at your trend line on your Guess My Age activity. Do you think that you had a strong correlation, moderate, or weak? And that's gonna be a different answer for everybody. Okay, now the last thing is talking about the strength of the correlation, and there's something that we measure it by, and it's called the correlation coefficient, and we abbreviate that with the letter R. I do not know why it's the letter R, but it is. So R is going to tell us, it's going to assess the strength of a linear relationship between two sets of data. So the correlation coefficient can go from negative one all the way to positive one, so obviously zero is right in the middle. If you have negative one, that is gonna be a strong, basically the strongest possible negative correlation. If you have a positive one, that's gonna be the strongest possible positive correlation. In fact, if you had a correlation coefficient of one, that would mean that every single one of your points was on the line. So your, your data was exactly linear. You didn't have anything that was off the line. When you did your line best fit, you basically just connected the points. That's what that would mean. And if it was negative, it would be exactly the same thing, except it'd be going in the negative direction. So you did a perfect job guessing. Okay, zero being right in the middle, this is showing no correlation. Okay, so that's gonna be no correlation. Now the stronger you get towards either side, the, or the closer you get to either side, the stronger your correlation. So we've got strong, and then you know if we go like here, that's gonna be weak, and that would be weak either positive or negative weak. And then you've got, you know, somewhere in the middle would be moderate. Moderate positive, moderate negative. And so it's just kind of like this scale. And so then the question becomes like, how do you know if it's moderate or weak? Where's the dividing line? So here's what this is gonna tell us right here in this information. So it says, let's just go through the bullet points. And it says, a correlation coefficient of negative one indicates strong positive. A correlation coefficient of positive one is strong positive. Or sorry, strong negative, strong positive. A correlation coefficient of zero indicates basically no correlation. We can say very weak, but if it was exactly zero, it'd be no correlation. And I'll just tell you right now, it is not even possible for me to give you an example of something with no correlation, because no matter how hard I try, I cannot find something with no correlation whatsoever. Even the paper clips and shoes, like, we have something. So probably nobody has no paper clips and no shoes or five paper clips, five shoes or, you know, whatever. I, th th there's always just going to be some correlation there. Perfect correlation of negative one or positive one occurs only if every data point is on the line of best fit. If you are taking a survey or if you're doing something like guessing or you're asking people questions, it is very unlikely that you're going to have a perfect line of best fit. So how do we know if it's moderate, positive or moderate or weak? So if we have between 0.8 and 1 correlation coefficient, we would call that strong. Same with the negative. Between negative, eight, negative 0.8 and negative 0.1, that is strong negative. If I have between 0.5 and 0.8, that's moderate positive. Between, um, where did my other moderate go? I'm not sure if I left something off or what, but anyway, if it's between 0.5 and 0.8, it's moderate positive. If it's between, we need to add this in here, if it's between negative 0.5 and negative 0.8, then that's going to be moderate. And then the last one is if it's between 0 and 0.5, so really close to 0, and 0 and negative 0.5, then it's weak. So that's how you tell the strength of your correlation. Okay, you should now be ready to do your assignment 6.1.